Now that we've covered several kinds of protostomes, let's look at the deuterostomes. The first group within the deuterostomes that we'll look at are the echinoderms. The echinoderms incorporate what's known as a water vascular system. The water vascular system can be thought of as a system of water pumps. Those pumps operate several different small appendages called tube feet. On the top right, you can see several of those tube feet exiting the exoskeleton. On the bottom right is a sea cucumber, another interesting example of an echinoderm. Echinoderms appear as though they have radial symmetry, but they actually don't. You can see that the madreporite is on one side of the sea star. You can think of the madreporite as being placed along the axis of its bilateral symmetry. The next group of deuterostomes we'll cover are the chordates. In this taxonomic tree, you can see that the chordates encompass mammals, reptiles, amphibians, and several other groups that you're probably familiar with. The taxonomic tree on the right is a more detailed version of the taxonomic tree on the left. You can see that the outgroup are the echinoderms. What separates the chordates from the echinoderms is the presence of a notochord. The function of the notochord is to provide skeletal support, and in some vertebrates, it develops into the vertebral column. Some of the characteristics of chordates are only present during embryonic development. These characteristics include a notochord, a dorsal hollow nerve cord, pharyngeal slits, and a post-anal tail. The dorsal hollow nerve cord develops into the central nervous system, which includes the brain and the spine. The pharyngeal slits are openings in the pharynx that develop into gill arches and bony fish and into the jaw and inner ear in terrestrial animals. The post-anal tail is a skeleton extension of the posterior end of the body. It's absent in humans, but present during embryonic development. The first group of chordates we'll look at are the cephalochordates. The cephalochordates include the lancelets. Lancelets live on the sea floor, buried in the sediment. They filter feed by exposing their tentacles to the passing current. Here you can see a photo of lancelets buried in the substrate. The next group of chordates we'll talk about are the uricordates. The uricordates include the tunicates and larvaceans. Tunicates are sessile feeders with a mobile tadpole larval stage. On the far right, you can see the tunicate larva. It includes gill slits, a notochord, and a dorsal nerve cord. Once they find a suitable location, they grow into a somewhat sessile organism that looks a lot like a sponge. What's interesting is that these filter feeders are actually more closely related to us than a lot of other animals. It's thought that tunicates are ancestral to all chordates. The next group of chordates are the craniates. The first group we'll look at is myxini. The myxini are the hagfish. Hagfish lack jaws and paired fins, but they do have a skull. You can see here that their teeth are radially located, but don't seem to be attached to any kind of a jaw. Hagfish are marine scavengers. Here you can see hagfish eating the dead body of a shark. As an anti-predatory defense, hagfish produce slime. In this example, you can see that when a shark approaches a hagfish and bites, it immediately secretes gill-clogging slime. Here you can see the result of a truck filled with hagfish that spilled onto the roadway. The slime produced by the hagfish covered everything, including this car. The next group of craniates we'll discuss are the petromyzontids. These are vertebrates. From here on out, all of the animals we'll discuss have a vertebral column. The petromyzontids include the lampreys. Lampreys are also marine scavengers, and they look a lot like hagfish. They lack jaws and paired fins, but they are vertebrates. The life cycles of lampreys include the stage that enters streams and rivers. They reproduce in fresh water and continue their development in marine systems. The next group of vertebrates we'll talk about are the nathostomes. Nathostomes are the jawed chordates. The first group of nathostomes are chondrichthys. Chondrichthys include several familiar organisms. 
The Nathos domes have vertebrae with jaws and paired fins. They also have a cartilaginous skeleton. Examples include sharks, rays, and chimeras. Here you can see several different examples of rays. On the bottom left is a freshwater species that's one of the large Contrictes also include sharks. Here's a bunch of different examples that I think are pretty interesting. On the bottom left is a thresher shark. It uses that long fin to hit prey and stun them. In the center is a leopard shark fluorescing under a UV light. The function of this is not clearly understood. This example of a pygmy shark shows an interesting evolutionary strategy. You can see that the pygmy shark produces bioluminescence. Its ventral side creates light. The purpose of that light is to serve as counter shading. In the deep waters where it's found, one of the only ways for predators to detect fish is by looking up at the light coming down from the sea surface. The shadows of fish are an indicator of their presence. To get rid of its shadow, this species creates light. On the top right is an example of what a predator would see if looking at the shark from below. On the top is the shadow without bioluminescence. On the bottom is the shadow with bioluminescence. You can see a black dot towards the head of the shark. This is thought to create the illusion of a smaller fish near the head of the shark. When something goes to attack that smaller fish, the shark can then eat that fish. The Grumman Avenger is a warplane that includes Yehudi lights. These lights increase the brightness of the shadow, so it's difficult to see this plane as it approaches in the daylight. On the bottom right is an example of a military drone that includes light as a countershading mechanism in daylight. On the left panel, you can see the drone clearly as a black spot. On the right, it disappears using light to get rid of its shadow. Now let's move on to the Osteichthians. The first group we'll look at is Actinopterygii. Actinopterygii includes the ray-finned fishes. Ray-finned fishes represent about 95% of extant species of fish. They usually have bony skeletons and lungs or a swim bladder. Here you can see several examples of bony finned fish, including the example of cichlids on the bottom right that we discussed in earlier classes. On the bottom left is sturgeon, a species that gives us caviar, but is also endangered. And on the top right, you can see mudskippers. Mudskippers live on the tidal mudflats of Southeast Asia. The next group of chordates we'll discuss are the lobed finned chordates. Remember that we are also embedded within all of these groups. That is, we are lobed finned chordates. We are also osteochthians. We are nathostomes. We're vertebrates, we're craniates, and we're chordates. The subclass Sarcopterygii includes the coelacanth. On the left, you can see a fossil of the coelacanth. At the base of its fins, you can see an appendage. On the bottom right is a diagram illustrating the bony structures within those fins. These bony appendages are thought to be ancestral to the appendages we have. In fact, we are more closely related to the coelacanth than the coelacanth is related to the ray-finned fish. The coelacanth was thought to be extinct, but in 1938 an example was discovered. They called this a living fossil. Since then, several examples of coelacanth have been found. The next group of chordates we'll discuss are the tetrapods. The tetrapods include several groups that you're probably familiar with. Tetrapods derive their appendages from fleshy finned fishes related to lungfish. Tetrapods include amphibians, reptiles, and mammals. Amphibians lack an amniotic egg. Tetrapods have four limbs and three chambered hearts. The first group of tetrapods we'll discuss are the amphibians. On the bottom left is an oxalotl. This species once lived in the lake that is in the center of Mexico City. On the bottom right is a kind of amphibian called a Sicilian. You may never have heard of a Sicilian. They're difficult to observe, they live underground, and they're pretty uncommon. The amphibian life cycle is tied to the water. Because of that, they're vulnerable to several different kinds of pathogens, including fungus. To the right is a species of fungus that infects frogs and other amphibians' skin. 
To the left you can see the life cycle of this fungus. Spores enter the water column and eventually affect the skin of amphibians. Once they grow within the skin of the amphibians, they discharge zoospores. During this process, the skin of the amphibian thickens and the amphibian dies. Here you can see a pond where a wave of infection killed every single frog. The last group of chordates we'll talk about are the amniotes. The first group of amniotes we'll talk about are the reptiles. Testudines includes turtles and tortoises. Squamata includes lizards. The largest squamate is the Komodo dragon. On the top right is a basilisk, an example we looked at before to describe surface tension. Crocodilia is an order within reptilia that includes crocodiles, alligators, and gharials. Aves is a class within reptilia. This includes the birds. Birds are firmly rooted within the sauropod dinosaurs, which are another group of reptiles. The last taxonomic group we'll cover are the mammals. One important feature of mammals is that they create milk. The monotremes are a group of mammals that lay eggs. The egg is retained for some time within the mother, which actively provides the egg with nutrients. The monotremes occur in New Guinea and Australia. The platypus is a monotreme that is one of the few venomous mammals. The male platypus has a spur on the hind foot that delivers venom capable of causing severe pain to humans. To the right you can see several different examples of monotremes. These include several species of echidna and the platypus. Marsupials are mammals that have a pouch where their young develop rather than a placenta. Marsupials are a dominant family group in Australia. Marsupial young are nourished by milk and the young develop more after birth. On the bottom left you can see a thylacine, the Tasmanian wolf. This species only went extinct recently. Some people believe that there are still thylacine individuals that have gone undetected. On the bottom right is a Tasmanian devil. The last group of mammals we'll discuss are the placental mammals. There are roughly 18 to 23 different orders of placental mammals, including us. Here you can see a broad diversity of placental mammals that indicate the many different niches that they've covered. On the bottom left is a very rare short-eared dog. To the right of that is a freshwater pink dolphin. These dolphins occur in the Amazon River. On the top right is a flying fox, which is a flying species of placental mammal. On the bottom right is a sloth. And in the top center is a taper with its young. That does it for our animal diversity blitz. From here on out, we'll be looking at larger patterns, which will involve interactions between different taxa, including plants, fungi, proteists, and animals.